Hi there, I'm Stephanie Cousy. I'm a member of parliament for Calgary, Vindapur and the shadow minister for transport. I wanna say hello to everyone out there, especially the good people of Calgary, Vindapur. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity for four years now to be your elected representative at the federal level. It's just always such a great joy for me to communicate with all of you and just have conversations um, about Calgary, Mindapur and Canada as well, and in the, as well the context of the two together. So I'm very happy to have this uh, Facebook Live conversation today. Budget 2021. All right, so it's the first budget in two years. Okay, yes, we had the fall economic statement, but it was not a budget. Um, so finally, after two years, the Liberals gave us a budget. A hundred billion in new spending. A hundred billion in new spending. I, I do get very uh, frustrated with all of the reannouncements, and it, it's really hard to follow the money. Um, but here, clearly, we have a hundred billion in, in new spending, 1.2 trillion in debt which is supposed to be at 1.4 by the middle of this decade, really scary numbers. Let's go over some of the highlights though. 30 billion over five years for childcare. This is something that uh, the, the Liberal government is really touting. And I've heard from a lot of you that you're actually more interested in a mechanism like the Canada Child Benefit, where you get the funding directly and you are able to make decisions um, as parents or guardians as to the care that you want for your children. And of course, it's very important to me as a mother as well uh, to give consideration to these things. 18 billion for safer, uh, healthier Indigenous communities, very interesting. 3 billion in long-term care. Calgary, Minnipore, we have lots of wonderful seniors here. I refer to as generation one of the oil boom. So something very relevant here, of course, long-term care hit very hard in the early waves of this, uh, first wave, I should say, of this pandemic. So um, some consideration there. 18 billion for green recovery, not something I'm, I'm super jazzed about, um, as I'm sure you know, not a single thing for the natural resources sector, which I, you know I advocate very hard for as a born and raised Calgarian and Albertan. And then the last highlight I'll mention, $15 federal minimum wage. So very interesting, uh, small business owners, we got a lot of you in the riding and of course across the country. Uh, part of our backbone, most definitely, um, this will have an effect on you as, as well. So I was very fortunate to be on Alberta prime time the day after the budget uh, to sort of give my initial impressions. And I mentioned two articles that I'm going to mention here again today because they really sort of stood out to me as sort of the message and themes of the budget. I really liked Andrew Coyne's article. A Andrew Coyne, a great, um, I, I wouldn't even say conservative, just sort of reasonable voice and sort of calling it like it is. But what he said was, this is a budget about everything except how we're going to pay for it. That really resonated with me. I really like that quote a lot. And as well from David Rosenberg in the Globe and Mail as well. He said that the budget used to be an economics document. It used to be a, a document about economics. Me, I was raised where a budget is. We bring in this much money. We spend this much money. This is how much money is left over. That's not the way that it is anymore. I was actually shocked to learn this as part of the public policy process. I, I now think it should be called economic priorities for the year, whatever, whatever it is. Rosenberg went on to say it used to be a document about economics, but instead it has become a social policy mantra designed to buy votes. Possibly. I, I, I think there's something to that. Well, I've got someone here today who is really going to help us unpack this. And I know we'll have a lot of incredible insight for Calgary, for Alberta, uh, and from, from the perspective of Canada as well, I am so proud to have with me today, Kim Moody, who is CEO of Moody's Tax. What a pleasure to have him here today. I'm gonna give a little bit of his, of his bio before um, we pass it over to him. Now, his bio starts as, I'm the guy that carries the tax act everywhere. Dinner with my wife, hockey games, to bed. At least I started to look a bit cooler once it was available on iPad. It sounds like a really great dinner date, Kim. Going on. Uh, he actually 
publish the book, Making Life Less Taxing. Pay attention to your taxes so you can pay less tax and build a strong, smarter Canada. I have this book. I like this book so much. I bought two copies, one for my dad, one for my brother, who are also small business people um, right in the riding here. Kim's primary area of expertise is tax and estate planning for owner managers of private corporations and executives, particularly those who have entered into the tax complexities that come with being affluent. Though admittedly not one himself, Kim works with many professional athletes. A guy has got a dream after all. Kim also has expertise in trust and estate taxation and enjoys solving the complexities that arise in developing a well thought out estate and secession plan and dealing with testamentary taxation matters. Deciding years ago that sleep was highly overrated, I agree entirely, Kim. Kim makes time to share his immense knowledge through writing, lecturing, teaching, and being an active national leader in the tax profession. This next part is super fascinating to me. In 2016, he fulfilled his long-standing goal of receiving admission into law school and is currently exploring ways to fit this ambition into his busy schedule. Kim's unique ability is being a loyal, transparent, and honest intellectual rebel who always does the right thing. And I'd like to think that's what being a conservative is about, doing the right thing. His passion to lead, teach, never settle, and both seek and speak the truth aid in his contributions to the tax landscape. Kim desires to be an inspirational example for those around him to continuously grow. And viewers out there, I can attest that this is absolutely who Kim is. He's just a good guy, he's a smart guy, and we're so lucky to have him here to share his insights today regarding uh, budget 2021. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, and uh, it's very kind uh, remarks, so I appreciate that. Excellent. So uh, I've given a little bit as to sort of my opening insights based upon uh, some of the commentary in the media, which really resonated with me. Can you provide for myself and for our viewers just sort of an, your, an overview of the budget um, from your perspective, just some of the highlights and maybe a, a generalization of what you see and what you think it means for Alberta and for Canada? Sure. Um, you know, I, I've lectured on this a fair amount since April 19th and and certainly on our, you know, our firm's blog, if you want to take a look at it, there's a fairly lengthy document there under at Moody's, moody'stax.com. But, uh, you know, I, I just need to provide some commentary uh, on, on the length it took to get the budget. Um, I think the government could be faulted, or try that again, could be excused for delaying the budget for a little while, given the uncertainty that the pandemic uh, provided. And I don't think you find too many reasonable people that that allow or you know that took issue with the delay. But when that delay stretched on and on and on, and spending continued to go on and on and on with uh, no rationalization, no reconciliation or transparency. Whoops. Um, sorry about that. That's what happens when uh, somebody calls me and it interferes with Zoom. So sorry about that. That's uh, okay. The. Um, it's the damn kids again, you know, bank of mom and dad. <laughs> they need money. No, just kidding. Um, but, you know, when, when it's stretched on and on and on, and I've been in budget lockups, you know, I don't know if your audience knows how this works. I'm sure they probably have some idea, but media and tax geeks like me, you know, are able to uh, go into lockup for eight hours prior to the budget being released. And for me, I always look forward to that, you know, going to Ottawa and, and locking down and spending a lot of time with a bunch of documents, because there's usually a lot there. And I'm a tax geek, so I like spending a lot of time on the tax material. But as time went on, and it stretched into a year and a half, or sorry, a year late, a year and a half, two years, you know, I think the average Canadian doesn't appreciate, but they should, that that is disgusting in my view, that is absolutely disgusting abuse of power. And um, because, and, and some economists uh, don't appreciate what I'm about to say, because they say that government is different than, uh, than households. And I call BS on that. Uh, I think governments and households, money is money. And I don't buy into the mon you know, modern monetary theory uh, uh, policy of, of economics. Uh, you've got money coming in, you've got money going out, you should have a budget. 
And if we managed our households the way that the government has in the last couple of years, we'd be broke. And it's as simple as that. And I am worried that that we're well on our way to being broke. So my overall comment is that I look at this budget as being part one and part two. Part one, uh, which clearly this is, is a buying votes. I mean, there's just no shortage of spending. And the spending is outrageous. And I mean, if you Google um, or do a search in the budget documents, which by the way, this, this is a record, you know, I, I printed it, killed a couple of trees printing the, the budget. Um, and it's 700. I didn't see that, wow. 764 pages long, that's a record uh, for, but I can tell you, it didn't take long for me to read it. And the reason is, is because it's a lot of bunk and a lot of junk. Bunk and junk rhyme, so keep that in mind. But the, um, because that, there's more words of um, gender, for example, in the budget than there is on things that you would look at normally for a budget, you know. Money coming in, money going out. Um, so that this is clearly a boat buying um, exercise, part one, spend, spend, spend. If the Liberals um, you know, get into uh, a majority position in the next election, watch out for part two, because part two will be where the real damage is. Um, and so, for example, there is a lot of people like me uh, that were concerned that we might see in this budget tax increases. Well, there was no tax increases. Uh, we were worried that we might see a wealth tax. No wealth tax. There's certainly an attack on the wealthy, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the luxury tax, which is, is a pretty ridiculous thing in the whole scheme of things. But, um, you know, for boats and, and, and cars, which I'll comment on in a minute. But, uh, but no, tax, no wealth tax. We thought we might be able to see, or try that again, we thought maybe, just maybe, even though it is a sacred cow, we might see changes on principal residence uh, uh, taxation because there is no shortage of trial balloons released by the prime minister's office on friendly articles in the press about, you know, maybe it's time to change taxation of principal residences. And it's clearly test balloons that were released. And, uh, but no, we didn't see that. Um, and so I think this budget could be summarized for a lot of what we didn't see, vote buying and deferral uh, in studies, lots of consultations. And I'm happy to comment on some of that um, uh, later if you'd like. So that's kind of my overall high level comment, Stephanie. Um, would you like me to comment on just some of the things from a tax perspective that, that were in there? Yeah, I think that would be very useful um, to our viewers as well, because I'm sure that would have a very uh, practical application. Uh, you mentioned the luxury goods tax and as Shadow Minister for Transport, that's certainly something that um, stood out to myself and I will be actually having a Cox Advisory Committee here in the near future to sort of have conversations with those marine organizations, um, airplane manufacturing organizations, even local dealerships have reached out to me, Kim, uh, in regards to how this will affect their business. So yes, please do um, go into sure. some of the tax implications. I'm just going to go off my cheat sheet here. Do there's, it. Uh, do it. An, this is informal. <laughs> I wrote an executive summary on all this stuff. Um, and so I'll just go through quickly uh, my executive summary. So, um, so for any business owners online, of course there is, and you probably already know this, there is the extension of the uh, wage subsidy, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to September. Um, they introduced a new program called the Canada Recovery Hiring Program, which it, it effectively was built off the architecture of the wage subsidy which is intended to encourage new employment. Um, so that, that was rather interesting, uh, very expensive ticket item. Uh, the luxury tax I already mentioned, but just in case you, it escaped your attention, I, the luxury tax is for um, cars and personal aircraft with a retail sales price over $100,000. Okay, so the, the media picked up on that because it's pretty easy to understand. But if you have a boat, for 250,000, not 100, but $250,000, you're subject to the retail, uh, sorry, the luxury tax. But if you buy a boat for $150,000, no, no luxury tax. Now you tell me, 
where, where's the logic there? <laughs> I would have thought that if they're going to do this, you would have maybe cars at 100, boats at 100 maybe, and then planes at 250 because planes tend to be a little more expensive than cars on average. But hmm, not sure the logic there. But anyhow, hmm. 250 for planes and 100, um, or uh, so, or sorry, two, what did I say? Uh, yeah. Hundred thousand dollars for uh, for cars and boats, cars no sorry cars and aircraft, and uh, boats is two fifty. So yeah, that was a little strange to me. And the the tax is material. It'll be twenty percent. It's the lesser of twenty percent of the value over the threshold, or ten percent of the full purchase price. So it's it's not just simply you know, 20% over the excess. So it's, and we'll see how this happens. And apparently it's supposed to start January 1, 2022. Is this a clear attack on the so-called wealthy? I guess so, because I guess uh, you, you're considered wealthy if you buy an SUV that, happen, uh, that happens to, uh, you know, have a cost over a hundred thousand. So, so in any event, that's that. Um, one thing that was a bit of a surprise because there have been no test balloons um, uh, or certainly no articles that I had seen uh, come out was for Canadian controlled private corporations, you're able to immediately expense uh, property, so-called eligible property, if you buy uh, property and it's available to, uh, to the business owner prior to January 1st, 2024, up to $1.5 million per taxation year. That, that's material. So that was a bit of a surprise. And to a certain extent, if you follow US tax policy you know they they introduced something similar during the trump regime and um and uh, the liberals refused to follow suit so it seems to me that they're now following in the in the footsteps uh a couple of years later so so this is something that we've received a lot of phone calls in in our firm uh, for private business owners and, and so computers and and uh furniture are, are two obvious things that you can buy an expense right away uh, you can't expense buildings. There's certain exceptions to this rule, um, but in parking lots, you can't uh, as well. But but computers, which is a big deal for most people, you can. So that was a surprise. There's some reporting rules that they want to introduce um, to the extent that you uh, enter into so-called aggressive transactions. They're calling them notifiable transactions. So, But there'll be a study on that. So we'll see what happens there. The press picked up on this one, um, you know, the so-called 3% digital services tax will be introduced on big uh, companies. I call it, and this is overly simplified, the Netflix tax, you know, and, uh, I, you know, there's certain good policy reasons why they probably should do that because the big tech companies are not, you know, they're, they're receiving revenues from Canadians, but they're not really paying any income tax. And the OECD has been struggling with this issue for years and years and they can't come to a conclusion and a consensus and so a lot of countries like france for example have introduced these digital services tax and canada has followed suit the liberals in the 2019 election um, had promised to do this and now it looks like they want to follow suit the downside to that though is that it's just going to be pushed down to the consumer um, so my netflix subscription will now be three percent higher which, okay, uh, for, for most Canadians, that's not a material amount, but it, it's not really achieving the policy objective of what they're trying to do, which is to, to collect taxation from profits generated in, in, uh, from Canadians. So there's more work to do there. Um, this one is a bit surprising to me, the so-called 1% tax, uh, the speculation tax, national speculation tax that they want to uh, introduce for you know, so-called vacant housing across Canada, following suit of what's going on in, in certain areas in British Columbia and in Toronto. Um, I think that's going to be a tough thing to pull off uh, on a national basis. And so I have my doubts as to whether or not that will be implemented on the proposed date of January 1, 2022. I think to do that in certain areas, you know, let's say a tourist town of Saskatchewan, for example, uh, where they rely on foreigners to, you know, for their tours, tourism industry, whether it's for part of the year or not. I think that could have devastating impacts in, in some cases. And also it could encroach on the municipality's uh, ability to, to raise tax as well. So I, I have my suspicion that that will be deferred. 
Um, as usual, significant money put into the CRA <laughs> with the usual rhetoric of that they're going after offshore uh, stuff and international tax. I mean, I don't know how many, how many, you know, the NDP love this topic, you know, because apparently there's just an infinite amount of money offshore and all they need to do is just go after that money. Well, BS, uh, <laughs> there's just not, not with, notwithstanding how many newspaper stories come out on this fantasy stuff, it's just not real. And uh, so we'll see what happens there. Although I, 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 I am happy that money apparently will be invested in, in technology improvements with Siri because they certainly do need to improve. Um, and uh, I think I'll skip a few of these things. Uh, the, the one that the Liberals had promised uh, in their election platform, which now looks like is uh, that they're serious about is that they want to restrict interest deductions to certain types of companies, not Canadian controlled private corporations that have taxable capital of less than $15 million, but anybody in excess of that, they're going to restrict interest deductions uh, to a maximum of 30% of earnings before uh, income tax amortization and depreciation. So if you have any car dealers on the line here, for example, where they really rely on, on floor financing or, or anything that generates interest expense, and a lot of these dealers certainly have capital over $15 million, that is really gonna be devastating for a lot of these dealerships. So you take the luxury tax on vehicles and then add on the interest deduction restrictions, it could have a significant impact on certain industries like this. So, so we'll see if that happens, uh, but, because I think there's some, well, there is some consultations that need to happen. Certain targeted changes to the disability tax credit being proposed um, and uh, some more studies on, um, on some various things. And um, that's probably from a very high level. Uh, oh, well, the other one that got the press all excited was uh, that the government is proposing to cut the corporate tax rate in half to the, ex to the extent that you uh, uh, are involved in qualifying zero emission technology manufacturing. And there's a long list of, of eligible manufacturing. And I, I find that um, not all that useful in the whole scheme of things. So to the average business owner. So that's uh, just a quick drive by. I hope that's uh, helpful, Stephanie. No, that is super helpful, Kim. Thank you so much um, for, for providing that overview and insight and then going a little bit more um, into specifics. So then it's safe to say, based upon your high level assessment, that you agree with the David Rosenberg perspective that this was a vote by, no doubt about it. And I love- In my view, sorry to cut you off, Stephanie, but in nope. my view, I, I, I'll debate anybody that thinks otherwise because it's so obvious on its face. It's almost shameless, right? It is, when, when you read the documents, which most Canadians don't, which I wish they would actually, I wish they'd actually Google the budget documents, spend 30 minutes with them, immerse, or eight hours, like I used to do it in the budget lockup. It's even better uh, with well, the fine glass. <laughs> uh, for no sure, but... Yeah, but you, uh, you're also an individual who carries the tax act with you everywhere, Kim. So uh, you are um, possibly an anomaly, an incredibly intelligent one. <laughs> possibly, <that>. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, in addition to that, you know, um, what you say is very scary about if they are reelected and get a majority, that's when we'll see the real damage. You know, if 1.2 trillion in debt isn't real damage, I, I don't know what it is, but you touched upon things specifically a wealth tax, uh, taxing your principal residence, like two very, um, very big things that Canadians should be uh, concerned about. And, you know, you talked about what we didn't see. And, um, you know, to add to that list, what we didn't see, which was very interesting, was the plan for PharmaCare that the NDP was pushing them so hard on, as well as um, provincial health care transfers, which the premiers have been very vocal about. Now, we've seen some other bits and pieces in regards to um, sort of along the edge of these things with long-term care facilities that I talked about, uh, rapid testing at airports, funding for that, these types of things. Um, but you're, you're right, there were some interesting omissions sort of from, from the other side in addition to not really saying what uh, the, the document was about, which 
both you um, and some people in the media have concluded was a total vote buy. So very interesting to have that perspective. Well, Kim, if you don't mind, then I think what we're gonna do is we are going to turn to some questions that we have received from viewers. Um, some we did receive ahead of time uh, as people were registering for this event. And uh, we are more than happy to accept your questions in the Facebook comments. If you have a question for myself or for our special guest here, um, CEO of Moody's Tax and Director of Canadian Tax, Adv Tax Advisory, Kim Moody, please feel free to put your question in the Facebook comments and we will do our best to get to all of the questions. So Kim, I'll start with a question um, from Sophia. And Sophia writes, with the federal government announcing a new program named the Canada Recovery Hiring Benefit, how will this new benefit affect me as a small business owner? Will I be able to access this benefit uh, as a small business? It's a great question, Sophia. And, and oh, the short answer is yes, it, it, it will and should have an impact uh, and a positive impact. I, I will say that like most tax rules though, uh, these are extremely complicated rules. Um, you know, the wage subsidy in and of itself is probably some of the most complex legislation I've ever seen. And it, it's, it's, it, it's um, very easy to apply online, uh, Stephanie, for the wage subsidy. Like I, I always tell people, you know, you've got five clicks, click, 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 and, and you get the wage subsidy in, in many cases. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm not far off. That really that that ease of administration really masks the complexity of whether or not you actually are eligible for that wage subsidy, and in many cases you're not. So the the new program, going to your question, Sophie, of you know the Canada Recovery Hiring Benefit, it, it's built off the architecture of the wage subsidy, and so all they're doing is is adding on another benefit to the existing architecture of the wage subsidy. So all to say that this, it's quite complicated. It's very, very complicated. So, but will it help you? Uh, yes, if you hire new employees and, and but eligibility is, is an issue. So I, my suggestion to you is to seek professional advice on this. Don't do it on your own. Certainly educate yourself on your own. Like go, you know, go to the budget documents or Google and take a look at at the Canada Revenue Agency comments on this, but be very, very careful about trying to click, click, click and, and get the uh, get the material yourself or get the benefits yourself. It is it is quite complicated, unfortunately, but short answer is yes, it will help. It should help. Thank you very much, Kim, for that uh, response for Sophia. I'm sure she greatly appreciates it. Okay, in my opening, uh, I mentioned that we are very fortunate in Calgary, Minnipur to have a large number of seniors. So I have two questions in a row here. The first one was directed to myself, Kim. So I'm gonna take that. And then there sure. is a follow-up uh, for you. So uh, Marie writes, is there any benefit for us seniors? The, and I hear about this a lot, um, I have to say. I know when you write back to me in, um, in the householders that I send out or in the, um, the communications that I send out, I consistently see that seniors are struggling to keep up with the cost of living, never mind uh, the severe mental health effects that this pandemic has had on you. I'm hearing um, really sad stories about seniors that are really struggling about not being able to see their families or friends or usually what is a great part of senior life, their extended social network. Um, so I am very happy to have so many seniors in my writing and to be able to address this question. But my point is, please know that when you do respond to me in a householder, I read all every single response and I hear your concerns and I hear how you're hurting both from a mental health perspective, but also financially. So let me get back to the question. The cost of living keeps rising, but our incomes are locked in at the same rate for many years. I know I should have saved more and I dearly wish I had that option. I raised my kids alone. Wow, congratulations, Marie. That's a big accomplishment as a mother. I, I will certainly say that. And I know uh, Kim is a, a father as well as he mentioned his kids earlier. So um, children are a joy and a responsibility, no doubt about it. I raised my kids alone and any investments were swallowed up in 2008. So I'm left with OAS and CPP with a small supplement via GIS. 
As you can understand, there's literally no room in my budget for increased costs. So a 3% Netflix increase, Kim, uh, might, might affect someone, someone like Marie or have a greater impact, I should say. By the way, this is the first time I've addressed this is I've been able to manage somewhat till now. Well, congratulations for that, Marie. Um, because that, that is an accomplishment in itself, and try to remain positive. And good for you as well, Marie, for maintaining your positivity during this difficult time. And grateful that the situation isn't worse. Thank you again for listening. Well, Marie, I've got the summary here of the programs which were provided for seniors, and some of them, which I'll go over briefly, don't have a direct effect on you, but there are some which, which do. So budget 2021 provides 3 billion over five years to support provinces and territories ensuring standards for long-term care. Okay, this does affect a lot of seniors uh, here in Calgary, but this doesn't apply to your situation, but nonetheless, for our viewers to know. Provides 41.3 million over six years and 7.7 .7 million ongoing for Statistics Canada to improve data infrastructure and data collection on supportive care, primary care and pharmaceuticals. I'm sure there's a lot of enthusiasm for this one, Kim, uh, given that the census was just due this week, I'm being sarcastic, by the way, provides 90 million over three years to Employment and Social Development Canada to launch the Age at Well Home Initiative to support community-based organizations providing practical support to low-income and vulnerable seniors age in place. Okay, you know what I really hope this one tra uh, translates into is um, funding for uh, at care at uh, care at home. I really hope that this is somehow from the 90 million trickles down into some type of funding for at home care for our seniors. I can't see it right now, but this is what I'm hoping it it devolves into. Provides 29.8 million over six years to advance the government's palliative care strategy and lay a better foundation for coordinated action on long term care and supportive needs. So continuing that idea. And I just want to take a moment to recognize our member of parliament um, from Sarnia Lampton and Gladu, um, who actually passed uh, the palliative care act so congratulations to her just a shout out. Provides funding of 27.6 million over three years for my 65 plus, a group tax free savings account offered by the Service Employees International Union Healthcare. It sounds really specific. I, I struggle, I struggle to identify a single individual I know who would qualify for this. But Marie, I am coming back to you. Here's here's um, what will apply to you. Provides a one-time payment of $500 in August 2021 to OAS pensioners who will be 75 or over as of June, 2022. Okay, there's something there. Introduce legislation to increase regular OAS payments for pensioners 75 and over by 10% on an ongoing basis as of July, 2022. So again, those last two things, um, a little bit more specific. I, I very frankly, Marie, I don't know how far a, a one-time $500 payment is gonna get you. It's, it's um, better than a lot of other things, um, but nonetheless, um, a one-time payment of, five, of $500. So there is what is contained in the budget for seniors and more specifically um, to your situation, because many of these, we talk about these large sums of money, but do we ever really see how they impact or affect our lives? Now, Kim, I'll come back to you for the second question. Um, relative to this from Judy. It says the one-time payment of $500 to OAS pensioners is for people over the age of 75. Are there any benefits going to seniors between the ages of 65 and 74? Not to my knowledge, although, yeah. I, I, stand, I, although I stand to be correct on that because I'm a tax expert, not a funding expert. But when I did look at that, I couldn't find anything. So. Yeah, no, I kind of, I, I, I resonate um, with you. I kind of feel, you know, if you're over 75, good for you. There are a few good things coming your way. Um, but if not, um, yeah, it's, uh, there, it's, I agree. I, I see very little. Okay, then let me go on to this next question for you, Kim, from Amir. As new interest deductibility limitations are included in the new budget, how will this affect my ability to deduct interest from my business income tax? Well, I mean, I think um, the, the, the general rule is what I uh, had already mentioned, which is you're going to be restricted to 30% uh, 
I, geez. Now my wife is calling me. <laughs> so, You're so loved, Kim. That's geez. wonderful. You're so loved. Sorry about that. I, I'm going to have to tell them never to call me during these webinars anymore. But anyhow, 30% um, limitation on uh, income for depreciation, um, amortization, and tax. So here's an example. And it only applies to, to companies that have um, taxable capital over $15 million, which if, if you're a capital intensive business, then it, in some cases it won't take hard or long to get there. So let's, let, let's just make up an example. Um, so let's say you've got revenues of $100 um, and your expenses on that $100, let's say you're in a manufacturing business and your capital is over $15 million. So these rules will apply to you. So $100 of revenue and your costs are $60. Uh, direct costs are $60. But let's say you've got interest costs of $30 because you've had to borrow to, to, uh, to buy all your, your capital intensive equipment. So your net income is uh, $10, if I'm doing my math correct here. For, did I say that correctly? 100 minus, what did I say? I, I lost track. I got to write this down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll start the example again, $100 of revenue. And let's say your direct costs are 60. And let's say your interest costs are 30. So your net income is 10. If these rules apply, and there's lots of devil in the detail and, and to the Department of Finance's credit, they've been starting to answer some of these questions already. But in this small example where your net income is $10 and your interest limit uh, deduction real is $30 in, in, under current law, well, your income before uh, depreciation, interest, and tax is actually 100 minus 60, which is 40. 30% 30 of that is $12, if I'm doing math correct. So your revised net income for tax would be have to, in, in the real example that I said, would have to increase by another $18, which is the denied interest deduction. So you're going to pay tax on $28 as opposed to 10 now you tell me that that's fair. Uh, I think that's ridiculous because at the end of the day, if the interest deduction is real, in other words, you've borrowed money to buy cap or buy equipment, for example, um, that, that denied interest, um, you're gonna end up paying tax on profits that you really don't have because the interest does reduce your, your real economic profits. The Department of Finance is concerned about, you know, too much interest being stripped out um, in, in non-economic situations. And I can understand that generally, uh, but in a simple example, like, like the person asking the question, uh, how it would impact my business? Well, hopefully my simple mathematical example shows that. And so um, it, it's, a, it, it, it's a real troublesome one, but they are promising to consult on this one. And I think there'll be some pretty robust consultations with people like, you know, tax specialists like me and others. So, uh, so I, I, I don't think we've seen the end of the runway yet on this one. Oh, thank you very much, um, Kim. I'm sure Amir appreciates that response. And um, in addition to that, you know, if you ever want to zoom in to help me with my son and his math homework as we go through this time of online learning, you know, I, I, I am more than willing to accept your help with that. So <laughs> thank you very much for um, walking us through that. Okay, I will take uh, another one here that I received. It is from Greg. Greg writes, money doesn't grow on trees and people need to think about their children and their children's children and maybe another five generations further down the line. It's not going to work out well. And I think about that all the time, Kim, about how does this not resonate with Canadians when they see these huge numbers, 100 billion uh, in new spending, 1.2 trillion debt. How I don't understand how they they can't make the connection that this affects them. It's not going to work out well. How do you see us moving forward and getting back to being fiscally responsible? Well, Greg, I am more than happy to answer that question. As we head into the end of the session here, I want to be very clear. I never thought there was going to be an election this spring, and I'm not going to get into the reasons why. I never believe that. However. 
I do believe we are headed toward election this fall. And so um, when I've had statements in the house or questions in the house, um, I've done my best to be very discerning in regards to what I'm choosing to speak and say, because I do believe um, it could be my final opportunities to speak in the house before we move into an election. But of course, um, very frankly, as a conservative member of parliament, I do believe that the only path forward is with a conservative government, Aaron O'Toole, um, as our leader, other incredible caucus uh, members, such as Pierre Polyev, um, who I know Kim has a great relationship with as well. They are of the same, the same ilk of the finance expertise. Ed Fast, our great new shadow minister for finance as well. Um, but, you know, I will tell you, Greg, if you haven't seen it, Aaron O'Toole has put forward Canada's recovery plan, which is focused on creating financial security and clarity as well and certainty. And we are confident that this plan will safely secure our future and deliver a Canada uh, where those who have struggled throughout this pandemic the most can actually get back to work. So this plan will ensure that uh, manufacturing at home is bolstered, where wages go up and where the dream of affording a better life for their children can be realized by all Canadians. And I'll use one specific example from this pandemic, and that is vaccine and therapeutics um, production domestically. Um, I, I strongly believe um, at part from a partisan position, but also as a parliamentarian for all constituents, that the government absolutely, the federal government absolutely messed up um, federal procurement. And one of the things they should have been thinking of from the get go last spring was internal vaccine um, production as well. So I think this is really a time where we can consider um, what does internal manufacturing capacity mean for our country? In this case, I really believe it means we would have been uh, further out of this pandemic by a good two to three months. I'm not even exaggerating as I see the UK, the US uh, moving forward from events perspective, from travel perspective, and here we are behind. Canada's Conservatives got us through the last recession and with Canada's recovery plan, I feel very confident we will be on a far better path. And so I hope Canadians will really um, take the time, as Kim mentioned as well, um, as to, to evaluate this budget and think, really, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for my family? What does this mean for, for our future? And, and really take some time um, to consider that. Okay, Kim, I'm gonna give you another question here um, from myself and it's sort of building upon the response uh, that I just that I just gave but um, it seems to me this this budget and this is along your idea um, of buy of buying votes which which I think we've both come to the conclusion we we agree upon um, this position and this might be our last question as well before we have to wrap up shortly um, this budget seems to rely uh, excuse me seems to spend heavily on special interest groups so it's i have one one great colleague tracy gray uh, mp for Kelowna lake country and a lot of times when she's talking about the liberal spending um, she'll mention it similar to the Oprah Winfrey show where it's like you get a car and you get a car and you get a car and I actually think that's uh, that's not a, a bad comparison at all in terms of what is happening. But Kim, for the average family, working parents, school age children, and this is generation two in Calgary Minipore that I'm thinking about now as well, all the wonderful um, new Albertan families, new Canadian families that we have in the writing. Are, it, are they going to be any better off? Is the average family, Kim, going to be, is there anything in this budget that makes the average uh, working Canadian family any better off? Give us, is, is there anything you can say um, positive about this budget that would inspire um, hope or uh, comfort regarding this, this budget at all? And it, it, if the answer is no, that's okay too. Well, the answer is no. Oh, Raz, <laughs> okay. I was, <laughs> I was hoping there, you. I mean, that. Despite all the uh, Oprah Winfrey, you get a car, you get a, yeah. you know, the, the, which there's no shortage of that, right? I mean, I'll, I'll, even with the, the $500 payment that's going to seniors at age 75, I mean, there's certain people, and it sounds like your constituent who asked the question uh, needed, needs that money and can use the money. I can tell you, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, I really question that and say, hmm, 
let's look at the line item. How much does that cost Canada? That's a tremendous, oh, that much money? Wow, that is tremendous. How many of those 75 year olds don't need that money? Is there a way that we could target that $500 to people like your constituent who needs that money? Uh, and I, I, I'm sure the answer is there probably is not an easy way to target that. I would, uh, but maybe there is. Maybe you can look at the income tax returns of people aged 75 years or older who have income below a certain amount of money and pay them that, that $500. Uh, because there's no shortage of 75-year-olds who don't need that $500. And so when I look at that and I think, is there anything out there to answer your question more full, fulsomely now? Is, is there anything in the budget that inspires hope or provides the average person um, or, or will provide to make them better off? The short answer is no. It's clearly a vote-buying exercise. There is one question that came in the chat here that I'll just address quickly as well that Please do. Is there anything in the budget that that you know helps entrepreneurs? And and and, and there is. And I the, the highlight one is the one that I mentioned in my executive summary uh, little speech there, which is the uh, the ability to expense otherwise capital items that would have to be depreciated over time. Computers, for example, you can now immediately expense those if they're if you purchase them after budget day, and they're available for use before twenty twenty four. And up to $1.5 million per year. That's going to be pretty helpful for the average entrepreneur, you know, um, and encourage them to perhaps invest in in um, buying assets, buying capital assets now, as opposed to um, you know holding on uh, later. I can tell you, in our own firm, we're, we're looking at uh, a significant upgrade of computer technology as a result of that. Um, so th those that's a good thing. The rest of it, not really. There's I, I do fear, though, part two. Part two, I think, is where you're going to see some real significant uh, damage. And that's where I'm hopeful that the conservatives can, you know, this is my partisan comment, because as, as I'm sure you know, I'm not a big fan of the existing government. Uh, but I, this is where I hope the conservatives can uh, make sure that part two doesn't happen. Yeah, no, it gives me chills uh, when you talk about it, Kim. I, I really hadn't even thought about um, that. I see a couple more questions in the chat. Maybe we'll try and get through those and then we will move to concluding comments and move on to the weekend. Sure. Um, from Julie, uh, tell us more about the plan for universal basic income. Canadians aren't interested in Trudeau's reset plan. Um, very frankly, universal basic income seems like part of the reset plan to me. But anyway, I believe this is corrupt and will lead to increased um, increased motivation in our in our country. I'm not sure if she means increased motivation to support um, conservatives, but anyway, maybe with that, Kim, I'll just I'll just ask for your thoughts on uh, UBI. What what are your thoughts? What are you hearing? Horrible idea, notwithstanding mm -hmm. all the articles that are out there. Um, horrible for a whole bunch of different reasons um you know not not including the cost and, and there's no shortage of estimates on how much it will cost i worry more about the softer side and, and we've seen a you know i think you invited me to the uh the human resource uh committee back last spring in may i did yeah and uh and one of my comments that that i made at that was you know people are on serve vacation and, you know, I, I got vilified for that comment, <laughs> but, you know, I, that was, that comment was, was, was real. And the example I used was my sister, if you recall, uh, owns a bakery. Yeah. She owns a bakery in the Calgary farmer's market. And, uh, you know, at, at, at the time, at the beginning of the pandemic, nobody knew what the hell was happening. Right. So of course people are shutting down and, and she was laying off workers and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, as you know, uh, when things started to ramp up back in May, June, uh, early May and, and June, she needed to hire some of these workers back. And the workers said, hmm, yeah, no, I'm making more money on CERB than I would if I came back uh, and worked for you part time. And I think I'll just stay on, on, on CERB, which was a real competitive disadvantage. And we're still seeing that with our client base, where people are on Canada recovery benefits or enhanced DI benefits. And, and there, and a lot of, a lot of workers like the restaurant across the street that I go to every day for lunch almost has a real hard time, even today with takeout, finding workers 
because the workers just are, are, are not motivated to come and, and, and be there. And so I worry about those kinds of impacts to the business community if you do introduce a UBI. Um, and so I just hope it never, ever comes to fruition. I, I, I worry for Canada if it does. No, that's great commentary, Kim. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, no, I do recall you uh, being at Huma last summer. And again, thank you so much for that. Um, where I, I, uh, I threatened to start my series of romance novels. Last year, the title was Friends with Sir Benefits. And this year, the, ro the romance title is Wendo Summer. You know, he, he couldn't give her her freedom. He couldn't give her her life back, but he could give her a Wendo Summer. So excellent. Okay, let's move on to our final question here. Um, within the chat, this one is from Nancy. I've read that with this budget, every man, woman, and child will owe $33,000. That is a big bill with no end in sight. This is horrendous. How can Canadians possibly prosper with this kind of debt on their backs? It used to be a chicken in every pot, and now it's uh, a negative $33,000 balance in the bank, Kim. You know, it's, it's a good question. How, how will uh, Canadians be able to... I, I'm not sure that they comprehend it. Like I was saying before, um, that they that this this amount of money is on each one of their banks. But how can Canadians possibly prosper with this kind of debt on their backs? Can we well, prosper with this type of debt on our backs? I think that that comment would be better answered by a guy like Jack Mintz, who's a you know world renowned economist, and and I'm a tax guy. But I'll just give you my common sense comments uh, on that. Assuming that is the right number, because I actually haven't. I didn't see that number in the budget, but yeah. it sounds roughly right to me, um, which is a fairly significant debt load. Um, you know, is that number real? Yeah. If you subscribe to the, you know, modern, modern monetary theory of economics, MMT, then, you know, then, then you, you're not worried about that because, you know, money will grow on trees apparently and will ultimately, um, uh, and we'll grow our way out of this, and and you know the the job of the job of government is to just redeploy that money, and we don't need to worry about debt. I, I think that's just bunk, and uh, happy to debate anybody on that. Um, and unfortunately, the only way you're going to get out of this is by austerity measures, which means cuts in services, significant. Um, and there's going to be some really really hard choices to be made in the future, or tax increases, or a combination of both. You know, if, if you're faced with a significant debt load uh, in your household and you continue to travel around the world on first class business class, do you think you can do that forever or do you think your credit card will eventually be cut up? It's eventually going to be cut up, right? And so um, it, it's not rocket science. It, it, it's quite simple. What's your inflows? What's your outflows? And if your inflows are a lot less than your outflows, in other words, your debt servicing costs uh, grow and grow and grow and grow and grow to the point where it's cutting services. That's a problem. So I, I do worry about this. No, thank you, Kim. And I do um, share your concern uh, most definitely, as does Nancy, um, it would seem. Well, this brings us um, just about to the conclusion of our time together this afternoon. Um, Kim, any closing remarks as we finish out the session today? Um, you know, I, I, I forgot to thank you for buying two copies of my book, by the way, um, which, which uh, you know, as I state in my book, um, you know, I really do hope the average Canadian takes an interest in this topic, you know, look, looks at the budgets rather than rely on media. Uh, because unfortunately, the media is number one, biased, and number two, not all that informed in terms of how complex the, these topics are. I don't think you need to become an expert in the budget, but you need to be informed and realize that, wow, these are some big numbers and this can't last forever. So take an interest in, in, in it and do, do your part. And, uh, and, and thank you very much for having me as a guest. I really appreciate it. 
Yeah, well, thank you so much, Kim, for joining us and for uh, joining the constituents here in Calgary, Minneport, and of course, all of our other viewers um, across Canada. It's, it's really been a pleasure to have you today and to really have your expertise um, and the lens that that provides for your overview as to budget um, 2021. There you have it, uh, folks. There we have, of course, again, Kim Moody, CEO of Moody's Tax. Um, again, I would recommend you purchase his book, Making Life Less Taxing. Pay attention to your taxes so you can pay less tax and build a strong, smarter Canada. I believe that actually came out right as the pandemic um, was setting in, unfortunately. I think that was one of the first online uh, Zoom events I remember attending, like in virtually in my backyard last uh, last <laughs> summer. So hard to believe we're almost at a, a year at its publication. Um, but thank you also to viewers out there for taking one hour out of your day, taking the time to join me to hear uh, uh, Kim's ideas about Budget 2021, what it means for Calgary, what it means for Alberta, what it means for Canada. And as always, I want to hear from you. Please never hesitate um, to reach out to me, to my constituency office, to my Ottawa office. I am here for you to serve you and to represent you. Um, and I think with that, we will conclude and go into the weekend. As Kim pointed out earlier, it is a beautiful day. I am seeing nothing but sunshine and we should get out there and enjoy it. So thank you so much again, Kim. Thank you so much to viewers. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.